praise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief.
At this time, in keeping with our tradition of reading the Ten Commandments on the first Sunday of the month, we will read them at this time. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, this punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. The Lord therefore blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor shall you covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, or his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Those are the Ten Commandments. And now from the New Testament, we will hear a short summary of the Ten Commandments and hear which one is the greatest. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the, Sa the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them was an expert in the law and he tested Jesus with this question. He came up to him and he said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Contributions at this time, for those who are listening online, can be given from home, and you could do that a number of ways. You can either mail it in or online via our website, or you could use the Church Center app. Today's offerings are for the Christian Reformed Shares. Also, if you need help, you may contact us at staff at TacomaCRC.org or contact an elder or one of your deacons. If you have a prayer request, please send it to prayer at TacomaCRC.org. Please note whether your prayer request is public or private. If you have a prayer request that is public, it will be sent to the prayer chain and private requests will be sent to our prayer team and that will include some people from the prayer corner as well. Please pray for our leadership this week as they work out the details for resuming indoor services that will begin September 20, 2020. Have a great weekend. Good morning. Welcome to Tacoma Christian Reformed Community Church. Jared and I will be doing the congregational prayer this morning. Can you say hi to everyone? Hi. 
Last time I did the congregational prayer, I talked about how the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. Jared, do you feel like a perfect, holy, and righteous person? No. No, me neither. That's why we are going to put on our mantle of righteousness. In James 5.16, it says that we have powerful prayers because God gave us his righteousness. And so when we pray, we are actually going to pray powerful prayers, and God will hear them. Let's pretend we put on our mantle of righteousness. Okay. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we would like to thank you that we get the privilege of praying for people today in our church and all around the world. Lord, we would like to ask that you would forgive our sins. Lord, we don't want there to be anything between you and us so that you will hear our prayers. Lord, we would like to ask that you would um, bless our families. Lord, we have lots of families in our church, and I would like to pray for those who are sick. Lord, there is, and you know all about this family, we've been praying for a long time. It's going to be her birthday soon, and one of her children's birthdays, and she's in the hospital, and we would like to pray that she would be able to come home for her birthday. Father, we would like to pray for Jared's family. And the homes and, and the families. Yes, Lord, we would like to pray for families all around the world. I think I forgot to pray about that. Okay. And hope they, that they be safe when they become Christians. Father, we would like to pray about school. That they reopen and, and... And Lord, we know that schools are important, and we pray that Jared's school and everybody's school would open soon, because they are essential. Father in heaven, we would like to pray for Pastor Nick, and hope that he does a good job this Sunday. Lord, help him as he makes his sermon. We pray that he would make his sermon so that we would all understand it. And would you help us to listen really carefully? Lord, I pray that you would keep us from wandering thoughts. And we ask that you would speak to us all personally and individually. Lord, we'd like to pray for our country. And, and the churches. We would like to ask that you would strengthen all the churches around the world, Lord, that we would speak the truth with courage and that our lights would shine so brightly that many people would want to come and join us as we worship you. Lord, there's been a lot of people who have been sick with COVID. We would like to pray for them right now. And the people and hope that this COVID goes away. Yes, Lord, please send this COVID virus away. And would you, we'd like to thank you for the people that we know who have been healed from it. Lord, we would like to pray for people who have um, lost their jobs at this time and who are sad and who who uh, need need work. We would like to ask that you would encourage them and help them to find work again. We would like to ask, Lord, that you would help us to be people who do good things. And the people, and the people who are sick in the hospital. Lord, would you encourage them and heal them? Father in heaven, thank you for who you are we love you very much. We want to thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. And the healing that you have done. Lord, you are our great healer. 
and you provide for all the many things that you have given us. Lord, we would like to ask that you would help us now as we, we listen to Nick's sermon, help us to concentrate, and would you speak to us through him. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you like to thank people for listening? Thanks for listening. Have a good worship service. Bye. Good morning, church. Blessed to be with you one more week before Pastor Clay returns from his vacation. And uh, let me tell you, I have truly been blessed to find an outlet to speak into our times and current state as a church from the scriptures. Uh, it is my hope that you will be encouraged and motivated to share the greatest news that there is. And boy, we sure could use some good news. Pray with me. Father, may your grace be real to someone listening today. May we see who you really are and who Jesus is. Word of God, speak. May our hearts and our minds be good ground to plant these ideas. Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your righteousness today. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. And all of God's people said, amen and amen and amen. Okay, uh, Saul, um, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I mean Paul, right? Uh, yeah, so you even changed your name? Where's your pride, man? Make up your mind. Are you Jewish or are you Roman? Are you a descendant of Abraham, our father, or not? You do know that taking the side of Gentiles denies who you are. Your own people. You know the importance of our heritage, and no one can take that from us. You know the Torah. You know that we have the Torah. And it is God's truth, not your opinion, that saves. His word reveals his will, and God never changes, for he is one. Salvation only comes through the fulfillment of his will, his way, as described in the holy texts of the law and the prophets. As it says in the prophets, you are standing at the crossroads, so consider your path. Ask where the old reliable paths are. Ask where the path is that leads to blessing and follow it. If you do, you will find rest for your souls. Ooh, I like this apostle. Get a lot of the Jewish guys sticking it to the high rise elite Jewish wannabes. <laughs> they are so into themselves. Whew. Not everyone feels closer to God by refusing to work on Saturday or by how committed I am to worrying about where I get my food from, or by circumcision. Really? Circumcision? Like for real? How in the world does that even work? Uh, being Jewish doesn't help with being a slave, with being dirt poor, or being the refuse of Roman society. I'll tell you what though, the one I don't get is Jesus. Why? Why all the runaround? Why did God have to save the world through these tryhards? Why did God have to come from those religious freaks? Why did Jesus have to come from those religious freaks? The Dems are at it again. No values, no morals, no God. There's a reason this country is going to hell in a handbasket. We need to pray and fight for our freedoms. Seriously, if you don't like it here in America, you crybabies can just leave. Complaining will not fix your problems, you hippies. Fix your eyes on the land of heroes and let their courage inspire. I'm telling you, God wants to bless us, but they're ruining it all with their pie-in-the-sky progressive ideas when all we really need is the Bible and God-fearing men to step up and lead. Don't worry. When we get to heaven, God will sort us all out. And I know where I'm going. Seriously, low. it's like the guy won't stop tweeting. Kind of reminds me of the rest of them raging at the fact that things aren't the way they always used to be. Yeah, okay, Boomer, thanks for that 2020 update. Go back to raging at the guy at the counter for not speaking English as well as you. And for your information, hablo español, not Mexican. Jesus clearly wasn't white. God isn't American. And no, I'm not interested in going to your church. I'm not like you, not by a long shot. I'd actually rather lick a cheese grater. If God is like you, 
If God's like any of you people, then sorry. Just not for me. Welcome to church in the first and the 21st century. <laughs> and the backdrop for continuing our study into Romans 4. So glad you're here. Uh, current political parallels notwithstanding, we talked a bit about how the social climate in Rome and ours today are strikingly similar, at least in regards to division, and how political division led to spiritual division in the church, right down political and ethnic lines. So two things before we engage, uh, just a quick refresher, sorry for the repetition of your last week. One, um, this comparison between the church then and now, I need you to keep thinking about it. That's on purpose. Try to identify with the Jewish Christians in the story of Romans. In chapter 4, Paul is going to challenge the many ways Jewish Christians had overstressed and overflexed the doctrines of their own salvation, that they had failed to see what they were saved for. As I stated last week, church, I urge you to possibly consider that we may be repeating the same mistake, being influenced by similar tendencies, driven largely by the same motives. Two, we have a tendency to approach Romans with the framework of the theological grades before us. And there is no doubt, church, that church leaders like Augustine, Martin Luther, and John Calvin, they've all impacted our understanding of how to read Romans. However, to put it in the words of my favorite professor, we must stop giving 19th century answers to 16th century questions and start asking 21st century questions, listening for first century answers. So I encourage you to engage the text directly and let Paul do his thing. It's actually pretty awesome. I'm excited, out of my mind to get started, so let's recap a little bit about chapter 3 before Paul goes on to prove his points in chapter 4. So in chapter 3 of Romans, uh, Paul began his argument by referring to God's covenant with the Jewish people. You remember uh, that same covenant that made them the Jewish people, the chosen people? God had made a covenant with Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. God's intentions with his world was to bless it through his covenant people. He committed and they committed. Paul states clearly that the reality was, though, that they had failed to be faithful to the task. Now, before we start thinking ourselves into any nonsense about Jewish people, let me be abundantly clear about a few things. Uh, Paul's references to Jesus as the Christ, it's not a last name. His mom wasn't Mary Christ or his dad, you know, Joseph Christ. It means Messiah, a Jewish title for a king. Use this hermeneutic often as you read through the New Testament. However, beyond that, we as Christians today can identify with the Jewish people in the desert with Moses, right? Tired of our path and being distracted by the idols of politics and self-medication. We are as stubborn as they are, and I would argue are also unfaithful to our call as the world's priests or agents of God's faithfulness. We are no better without Christ. But I digress. Pastor Paul then teaches that God's righteousness isn't revealed in how well we do all the things that God's word says. It is revealed in God's faithfulness to his promises, like the one he gave Abraham, through the finished work of Jesus the Messiah, and what that faithfulness reveals in us, his righteousness. That's in Romans 3, 21 to 25. So Paul taught this wasn't even an original idea. You know, the idea of, of God incorporating people into his right standing you know, uh, or into his righteousness because of faithfulness. It's something he had done before and can be proven in both Torah and the prophets. You see, Paul called this a gift of grace in Romans 3.24. And this is what he will do in our chapter now. So if you didn't catch last week's message, do it. I had more fun writing it than you could ever imagine. One last note about chapter 3 before we jump into chapter 4. And this is on the word faith. Faith is a multifaceted word. We have our own ways of using it in English, and it can mean many things in different contexts. In the New Testament, though, the word pistis is probably more multifaceted than it is in English. However, we can narrow it down here in Romans because of how pistis is used. So, for instance, if you look at verse 22 of Romans 3, you'll see it says the righteousness of God through, and it's traditionally translated as faith in Jesus Christ. But maybe in some of your Bible translations, you'll notice that there's a small footnote on the bottom of that that, uh, that says you can also translate it as the faith of Jesus Christ. 
And here's the idea. When we're looking at that as the faith of Jesus Christ, you can also translate pistis in this context as the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. In other words, the passage would say the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now, for what it's worth, church, it's very eye-opening for me personally to see some passages discussing faith as faithfulness. And I would submit to you that this gives the idea of faith a graspable edge, something less abstract and, and much more applicable. More importantly, doing this does not exclude faith in Jesus in the slightest, but serves to complement Paul's intent at the beginning of Romans 3 and what he goes on to prove in chapter 4. So just a heads up, I will be making references to faith as faithfulness in light of this. And I love all that that implies, but more on that later. Also, if you get the chance, look up James 2, 26 to 28, and uh, faithfulness is going to help you work that out. But that's only if you're curious. Have fun. <laughs> Toward the end of chapter 3, uh, Paul concludes that in our justification, we are all equalized and united with one another in Christ through his faithfulness to God's covenant. This is Romans 3, 26 which isn't an abandonment or neglect of God's law, but an affirmation of it. And that's verse 31 of chapter 3. And so that's how Paul start. So that's how Paul recap, you know, chapter 3. But Paul already knows the Jewish answer to this, the, you know, the Jewish retort to this. Uh, Paul, and that's true, prove it. <laughs> and so he does. Right from the Torah and the prophets like a total boss who had studied under the best or in the greatest. The story narrated in Romans church, you'll see, is that in the Messiah, God has been faithful to Israel and been merciful to the nations, just like scripture said that he would be. That's why the runaround. God's dealings with Israel and the Gentiles or the church and the rest of the world for that matter, are not two conflicting narratives, but part of one story that all point to Jesus. Enter chapter 4, baby. All right? <laughs> so Romans chapter 4, uh, with that as a recap. And so now you know Paul is going to now um, um, prove what he just was saying in Romans 3. And the way he's going to do that is that he's going to take some pictures from the Old Testament and use that to prove his point. Now, we call it the Old Testament, but for the Jews, this is the Law and the Prophets. So very much in the way that Christians treat the Bible, Jewish people treated what we call the Old Testament. And that's what is the Torah and the prophets, by the way, uh, particularly in this context. So Romans chapter 4, you're going to notice a few things um, as you read through it. You'll notice that Paul continues to show his, his well-grasped understanding of Jewish law and teaching methods. Uh, he uses a classical Jewish way to form and present an exegetical argument known as Midrash, used mostly to address contemporary issues and scaffold news stories. This method works by making connections between new and present realities and the unchanging biblical text. In this Midrash, Pastor Paul is going to draw parallels of justification by faithfulness between Abraham and David as subsequent representations of both the law and the prophets. At the nucleus of Paul's argument is verse 3. And we need to read verse 3. Verse 3 is uh, is his uh, proof text. It's his core source. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. He says, for, uh, for what does the scripture say? You see, he's referring, what does the you know law say? And what does the prophet say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. It was reckoned or intended to him as righteousness. Paul, church, is concerned with what the true meaning of the Torah is for the revelation of God's righteousness in the gospel. A gospel that is truly inclusive in its nature and intent. Abraham's faith, as described in Genesis 15, when properly understood, requires a recalibration of how we see God's promises, his covenant, law, and his salvation. Because Abraham's faith proves that justification is by faith and not by works of the law, nor is it restricted to the people of the law, Paul is able to 
to jolt a distinction between Israel's election and Israel's law, re-stipulating election around God's faithfulness and what it does in us. Abraham, anyone? Case in point, we will see this in depth more in verses 18 to 25 in just a little bit, but check it out now in verses 3 through 5. Look what he says. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are reckoned or intended as a gift, but as not as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So here, he, Paul brilliantly scaffolds the Abraham story sociologically to dissolve communal subcategories of second-class insiders within Jewish and Christian assemblies. You know, these like, you know, these guys that were treated as secondary people because they weren't believers. You know, sometimes this happens in actual church too. Uh, there, there'll be people that are coming to church looking for God, looking for comfort, looking for 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 whatever it is that they're looking for in God. And the response that, that they'll get from Christians is just that they won't help them until they are given the chance to basically shove Jesus down their throat, right? And so um, um, there are some people that aren't ready to hear the message of Jesus, but are ready to see Jesus in you, are ready to see that righteousness shine through you. And that's not a condition for that to be the case. And that's Paul's. That's going to be Paul's argument as we continue to read. So he says, To one without works, uh, trust him who justifies the ungodly. Such faith is intended or reckoned to him as righteousness. So again, um, uh, he does that to dissolve communal subcategories uh, by, uh, you know, by scaffolding the Abraham story sociologically. But he also recasts the story theologically to shut down any notion of salvation as a reward for the chosen. Look at it in verses 16 through 17. Check this out. For this reason, it depends on faith or faithfulness. In uh, his faithfulness, that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faithfulness or the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all. Do you know the Abraham story? Um, you know, uh, Bible, Torah section, Genesis, nobody knows who God is. Everybody's worshiping idols and inanimate, uh, and inanimate objects like the sun. Uh, God calls him to leave everything he knows behind, to follow him into the desert and to an unknown promised land, to a, to a promised family and descendants, to a promised state of the world in blessing. Long story short, Paul argues that God's promises supersede his commands for Abraham was considered righteous by God before he had any chance to prove it in any form of obedience that's verse 12 look what he says it in verse 12 and likewise the ancestor of the circumcised that's Abraham who were not only circumcised but who also get this who also followed the example of the faith or the faithfulness that our ancestor Abraham had before he was circumcised in other words before he could do anything that 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 was a fulfillment of God's command in the sense of here is a command that I want you to fulfill it or here is a sign um, that you are going to do that would distinguish you from other people. I want you to do that. And so before Abraham could do any of that, to prove that he believed any of that, God counted toward Abraham the fact that he truly and genuinely believed in God's promises. He believed in God's faithfulness to his promises. And I want... I, I would love you to see that, church. Let this hit you like a ton of bricks. <laughs> he didn't do anything at all to earn this righteousness. Just faithful. Just faithful to the promises God gave him. He took God at his word and, react, and, and reacted to it as if he, you know, as if it was already happening and underway. Check out this amazing description of Abraham's faithfulness in verses 15 to 21. Look what he says. 
pure power of these verses. Look what it says. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous will your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, or his faithfulness didn't weaken when he saw his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Again, she was also old. So God promised him that he was going to have kids and have descendants, even though he was a hundred. That's awesome. I mean, I I tell a lot of um, you know premarital counseling you know folks when I sit down with them. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you're married at 20, it's one thing. And when you're married at 30, it's a completely different thing, right? But if you've been married since you're 20 and then, you, and then you're married when you're 30, and then it's not the same as being married when you're 40, right? It's like the more you are with your partner, the more you get to know your partner and they know you and, and you know, the love just grows and the trust between you grows. I mean, um, 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 you know, 20 is nothing like 30, 30 is nothing like 40, 40 is nothing like 50, 50 is nothing like 60. I can't imagine what a hundred's got to be like because <laughs> they were clearly sexually active to have kids. But I digress. Completely lost track of everything here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no distrust, the scripture says, made him waver concerning the promise of God. So even though he was old, even though he wasn't sure that he was going to be able to have kids, he completely believed in what God promised him, that he would have descendants. Not only did he believe wholeheartedly, but then when he asked him to circumcise himself and his descendants, you know, as a sign for him and all of his descendants, and I can almost imagine Abraham saying, yeah, all of them. I can see all of them already, and I'm 100 and uh, no kid yet. But he didn't do that. He believed that God was going to be faithful to his promises. He believed that God was going to be faithful to his promises. No distrust made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew stronger in his faithfulness as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith, his faithfulness to God's promises was reckoned to him as righteousness. This is why I love the idea of understanding faith in the light of faithfulness, church. We are faithful to what we really believe in. We are faithful to what we love. We are faithful to what we really care about. We do everything we can not to prove our faithfulness, but because of who or what we are faithful to. Abraham was faithful in his sincerest belief of God's promises to him in spite of his present circumstances and or inability to bring them about himself, which, by the way, he did try doing later, I might add, didn't work out. Um, <laughs> he might have had his doubts, but he didn't waver, it says in verse 20. This is faithfulness language. Instead, it says that faith grew not because he was obeying, his faithfulness grew not because he was obeying, get this, but because he was convinced, persuaded of God's ability to come through on his promises. He trusted him and because he did, he found himself faithfully emulating the righteousness of his faithful God. Believing it, church, proves it. Nothing else needed. Do you hear me, church? Nothing else required. Not your church attendance, not your tithes and offerings, not your spiritual disciplines, not your social status, not your race or your ethnicity, your sexual inclinations or your gender. Simply believing in God's promise is more than enough. Simply believing in God's promise that he is more than enough. You see, Paul's exposition of Abraham's faith as faithfulness illustrates its dual role in how God saves people and how they are chosen. Look at it in verse 13. For the promise, get this, for the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness, not in, but of faith. <laughs> to his descendants of the law, but through the righteousness of faithfulness. 
So now notice the argument. I'm going to recap the argument that Paul's making. Abraham, instead of seeing the facts of the present circumstances or times, was unwavering in his being convinced or his belief in that God would be faithful to his promises. And in comparison, God instead of seeing the facts of our sin and unfaithfulness in the present time, was unwavering in his faithfulness to his promise that he would make the world right. And so in his faithfulness, God reveals through Abraham and all who believe the same way Abraham did, his righteousness, his righteousness. As a result, church, the conclusion is, God, did, God doesn't make people right with him based on anything they can contribute, including obedience. Paul's argument proves concepts like God's justification and righteousness as inclusive in nature to begin with. While like the Jewish Christians, we see our salvation as a means of separation from the rest of the world, God reveals in his faithfulness that justification is meant to bring in people who did not belong. While we were yet sinners, and in this the righteousness of God is revealed and demonstrated. Look at how Paul words this in Romans 10, verses 3 through 4. This is Romans 10, verses 3 through 4. Get this. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. If Jesus became sin for us on the cross, his resurrection is a cosmic verdict that Jesus is the Messiah, Lord and Son of God. So on the cross, Jesus undergoes our condemnation for sin and in his resurrection, he becomes the source of our justification. We are justified because our attempts at his righteousness have been forgiven at the cross and because we are incorporated into the justification of Jesus the Messiah in his resurrection. You'll find that in verse 25 of chapter 4. What God did with Abraham and subsequently with all who believe like he did demonstrates what Paul would later in chapters 9 through 11, but particularly in chapter 11 verses 18 to 22, as being grafted in. A few very interesting points to make from this biblical example. Okay, um, in grafting, which by the way is like a horticulture or a gardening um, um, uh, method of joining plants together, okay? In grafting, you join parts from two or more plants so that they appear to grow as a single plant. The upper part of one plant grows on the root system of another plant. A new plant that grows from being joined to another at the root, get this, will be exactly like the plant it came from. This method of plant reproduction is usually chosen cuttings from the desired plant root poorly. In other words, um, um, this method is, is selected because usually when you try to just cut off and you know, put it in the ground, it doesn't root very well. And so by, uh, by using these methods and connecting them, it will give the plant a certain characteristic of the rootstock. For example, hardiness, drought resistance, or disease resistance. So like you could actually get some traits from the root to strengthen the actual plant. Or in this case, righteousness. What being righteous in God's eyes really is, and it's Jesus. He is the richness of the root we have been grafted into. We are grafted into Jesus, not by anything we can contribute, but because he is faithful. Grafting imagery, church, is meant to indicate inclusion and incorporation, grafted into and belonging in God's righteousness and to one another. Altogether, 
in a beautiful tapestry of grace and community, we are to discover that his faithfulness inevitably compels in us both the will and to do, to be faithful ourselves, demonstrating live and in color God's righteousness as our own. Wow. So when God sees you, he doesn't ignore you to see Jesus, his son. He sees you, the one worth dying for, the one he gave Jesus in exchange for, welcomed and included in his family, rooted freely, gracefully, righteously, faithfully in Jesus. It's not that you are this human husk meant to house Jesus because that's God's preference and not your rotten sinful self. No, 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 no. Jesus didn't die for human standings. He died for family. And all you need to be and all you need to be included is to believe in the promise that he already did. And to react or respond with faithfulness to that promise. That's it. Really? That's it. Church Faith can be dangerous. When we put on our faith, when we put our faith in things, people, or ideals, we run the risk of the greatest danger of misplaced faith, broken faith. When the things we put our faith in betray us or let us down, it can be devastating. Maybe some of you here today have put your faith in a church or in a pastor or in an ideal that have been profoundly betrayed or let down. It is usually when faith is broken that we are the most changed or impacted and not always for the better. But Paul brings something deeper to the surface. The faith of Jesus is deeply rooted in God's promises. Promises that supersede even his commands. So that what was promised through the faithfulness of Jesus, the Messiah, might be given to those who believe. That's both Romans and Galatians 3.22. So when we discover who Jesus is, church, and find ourselves embraced included and justified regardless of our contributions or lack thereof the impact and results are greater than that of broken faith because while placing our faith in people things or ideals might break us the faith of jesus that we already have as an inevitable reaction to his faithfulness strengthens our resolve like we see in verse 19 is a faith or faithfulness that is wavering even in the presence of doubt in verse 20 and get this it reveals god's righteousness in and through us like chapter 321 says i want to close with that idea in mind you see, God has promised to make the world right in his new covenant. How do you think he intends to do that? You, you see, his intention is to make the world right through his covenant people. Did you hear that, church? God wants to make the world right and live in it. And the world is waiting it is waiting for us to get our heads out of our collective butts and truly reveal his righteousness and how we respond to his faithfulness. To be faithful people in and through the one who was faithful. In the words of Romans 8, 9, creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. How then can I relate this, grasping at the straws of what the heck my faith is, when in reality, his faithfulness includes me and his righteousness, grafted into a family that is grafted in him, great is his faithfulness. 
This serves to prove that I am justified only by what he has done. And what he has done does in me serves to prove that he is one. As he wishes us to be. Compelled to be demonstrated in my faithfulness. There I say, though afraid of being considered faithless. Graspable. Reachable. Accessible. Livable. Rest and good news. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your righteousness, your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Jesus, may our faithfulness be made manifest in our response to yours, revealing you to the world. Holy Spirit, teach us how to truly rest and share in this very good news. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, man.